that crisis? Well, I refer to this in my book and um, elsewhere as the financial crisis part two. It's a continuation of what we had during the previous. There are the same issues being brought up today as they were basically 10 years ago. We were told that everything is fine in Canada. Everything is rainbows and flowers and sunshine. And then you look at this home capital where individuals had liar loans and all this business very similar to the subprime crisis that was experienced in the U.S. And this has caused a major disruption in the financial industry on the inside. You'll never see it, but that's the way it happens because it's all covered up. The problems are there, the bank run occurred, but nobody knew about it. Forwarding over to Spain, you have banks that get annihilated for different reasons, but have no fear because a bigger bank will be there to gobble it up. And why do they do this? To consolidate power. It is a great opportunity for the powers that be to consolidate power, um, more and more power into the hands of the few. What a great way to actually get the permission of the citizens, yes, save us, rescue it. We don't want to have any problems. We don't want to lose our deposits. We don't want to have a catastrophe or a domino effect. Save us, save us. And you are able to buy this corporation for pennies on the dollar. This is the type of thing that they've been doing to us ever since 2008, of course, before that. But just to stress what has happened in the recent past, it's the same thing. Nothing was solved. Nothing will be solved. And as a result, we can expect conditions to get worse. In, in the case of Venezuela, they're going through very, very tough times. Their currency is being devalued. People are finding it very difficult to find supplies. Supermarket shelves are emptied. People are going across the border to get supplies. Do you see the same type of scenario maybe happening when the system comes down here? I believe so. Perhaps not to that extreme degree, but it wouldn't surprise me to see major cities in a state of bedlam. The reason that Venezuela is in the troubles today is because they try harder and harder to fix the problem. That's what we see. You know, there's different, ultimately different um, things that are happening there right now. You have a government which is incompetent or perhaps simply just corrupt, but you also have outside forces which are affecting it. Regardless, every time they try to intervene, they only make it worse. They absolved the legislative branch. Of course, you're going to upset people. Of course, people are going to come out on the streets. They're going to start to smash in the store windows, causing riots. Then you have a problem, and that is civil unrest. You have the military coming out to aid and support the police. You have the police obviously being there, smashing in some skulls, and nothing ever goes right after this. It doesn't ever get better. I assure you the conditions will continue to get worse. I have people contacting me from inside Venezuela, inside Caracas, and they're telling me just what you see in the news. They are confirming that. They're saying, I can't even go walk down the street without the threat of being mugged. Don't even think about going to a park. You'll definitely get mugged. You can't get food because by the time you wait in that two-hour lineup, by the time you get to the front, there's nothing left. So you go to the black market. But guess what? You can't afford what those black market prices are. And this has happened very, very quickly. See, we look at the, let's say, a price of a loaf of bread is five dollars let's just say okay maybe it's really expensive compared to what it was before but you know what no big deal i can afford it even on a minimum wage salary but what if 
you can't get there in time because it's all sold out. Now you go to the black market and that same loaf of bread costs you $100. Well, suddenly you're not eating bread. And that's sort of a simple example, but that's what's happening. So it's not just about simply that it's hyperinflated. There's a, there's a whole bunch of other um, layers to this and people aren't really addressing that. Never mind the mainstream media, that's for sure. Yeah, that is true. I wanted to talk about the video that you created um, called uh, Countries That Are Selling Their Assets to Avoid a Collapse. And I wanted to, you to explain to everyone why countries are selling their assets. What is the reason for it? And do they have to do it? Well, this is um, a plan that has been really put into effect since the financial crisis. I've noted this, I've been talking about it for quite some time. I've put it in black and white. I know what the situation is going to be. In order to have a wealth transfer from the individuals over to, or let's say the middle class, over to the elite, you have to engage in a series of crises that are very, very detrimental. In this case, you had you know, the financial crisis. Banks were starting to implode. You had subprime mortgages, which you know, came before that. And people were in dire straits. You had the um, sovereign debt crisis in Europe. That, none of those issues have been fixed. As a result, you have a series of bankruptcies which are occurring this goes for corporations this is cities states provinces and nationally as well you have an opportunity for the elite to come in and rescue these different um you know corporations everything else look at what happened with warren buffett Everyone likes to follow what Warren Buffett did, thinking if he invested in Bank of America, so should I. But Warren Buffett put in billions of dollars because he got a sweetheart deal. He got a deal that you and I could never get. And he was there basically bailing out the bank so that they didn't have to nationalize it. Or else they would have. They would have done something like that. Then you look at the uh, sovereign debt crisis. Look at Greece, perfect example. They're in such bad shape. You have people consistently going onto the streets and they are constantly, or at least previously, were constantly, constantly rioting. Even when they said, look, we're going to hold this vote and you decide, do you want the bailout or not? Let's let the people decide. And Overwhelmingly, the people said, no, we do not want the bailout. The very next day, they said, we're going to go ahead and we're going to accept the bailout. They don't care. The government doesn't care about you. So as a result, they are just simply following the orders of their supranational masters. So the IMF, the UN, the EU, they're all making the rules. They're all saying what happens. And they're the ones who have their friends in very high places of government. And they make this happen. So what they do is they bankrupt a nation like Greece using credit default swaps. You put them into a state of poverty. You say you need to have austerity. You need to suffer. And as a result, we are going to engage in a few other policies. One of those being, we'll take some infrastructure off your hands. That airport looks nice. I'll take it for 10% of what it was worth a few years ago. And those streets, just as I did a, a video, I believe it was in Houston, where actual streets and other infrastructure, sewers and everything else, are being sold off. This is how it all works. You can transfer wealth from the public sector to the private sector but you and i are getting the short end of the stick in both situations that's the way it is and this is a scheme a genius mad scientist level scheme that is going on it's getting worse you can see it happening globally and nobody's paying attention to it because 
the stock market keeps rising. Yes, and that's true. I mean, you mentioned the stock market, and just uh, on the thing was a Friday, uh, the tech stocks that you know they all of a sudden declined, and people started to get nervous about this. But we know the tech stocks like Apple, we know Switzerland, they're purchasing a lot of these stocks. We know the central banks, they've been purchasing a lot of these tech stocks, and they pump the market back up. And when you look at the stock market compared to the actual economy, these two things, they're not connected at all, correct? That's completely, completely, 100% correct. There's no link now, there's no link in between the health of the economy and the stock market. And when you look at the, I mean, the stock market's continually moving up. I mean, it's at, what, 21,000 something points. And it's, these companies have no earnings. Uh, you know, sales are down the tubes and you scratch your head saying, how could this possibly be? It makes no sense. And then you look at the economy. I mean, we look at retail, we look at housing and we see things are really imploding on themselves. When you look at what is happening in the real economy, I mean, you're up in Canada, I'm here in the States. Are you seeing the same exact things happening where things are starting to deteriorate and fall apart in the real economy? Absolutely. You can see that going on. Um, I mean, just take, for example, Canada. Canada as a nation, it's quite diverse, but let's just take Toronto and Vancouver. You look at this, the housing prices continue to rise, yet more people are in debt now than ever before. The more, the most amount of debt ever, let me say that. As a result, there's actually somehow less bankruptcies than before. How is this the case? Well, they've racked up all this credit card debt. They've been buying all these gizmos and gadgets. And they use the value of those homes in order to pay off those credit cards. So they take a home equity loan and they just simply think, the housing prices will continue to rise, interest rates will remain low, and therefore, I've got nothing to worry about. And this is what people have been doing. So they say the economy is doing well. I have a luxury vehicle, I live in a $1.5 million home, and life is beautiful. Well, actually, you're holding on to a hell of a lot of debt, and things aren't doing well. Why? Because we know that wages have been either stagnant or declining in real terms. Then you take an area which has suffered, um, like the uh, oil regions, of Canada, okay? These areas, the unemployment is high, the vacancies are high, and you'll see that the general economy in this area is not high. The, the real estate has declined significantly. So what we need to understand here is that it's not all a pretty picture out there. The stock market is doing one thing, but the actual economy, it's all over the place. And in most cases, Things are not doing well. You're looking at it. I mean, sure, there, there are some upsides. You definitely see that on occasion, but those are few and far between. Now, I think uh, Bank of America came out with their uh, report looking at the stock market, and their report says that it is overvalued. And we can see that it definitely is. And while this is going on where the stock market's moving up and we're seeing, you know, retail stores closing left and right, there's thousands of stores. We have the Federal Reserve where they're going to make a decision this week if they should raise the rates or not do anything or lower the rates. I, I don't think they're going to lower the rates. What is your take on what you think the Fed is going to do? I think the goal here is to raise rates. I don't know if necessarily they'll do it this time around, but you can see that they're going for that policy. I would say that in order to give strength to the currency, they would want to increase rates. I have found historically, as far back as I've ever read, that they always go too slow and they're too late. That's generally how the Federal Reserve reacts. And they do so on purpose. There was only one instance of them increasing rates at the actual rate it needed to happen. 
um, to, to uh, stifle the inflation. However, what we're seeing today is, I think, just the beginning. Part of what I've um, thought about o- over the years is um, something that is quite contrarian to uh, most people, what they believe. And that is, we know that if the interest rates get to a certain point, it's going to really put a uh, a big dent into everything about the economy with uh, borrowing, with the stock market and everything else. Interest rates being low is, let's say, good for business in some ways. I believe that interest rates will increase intentionally. I believe they want to increase interest rates in order to crash this system. And I do think the powers that be want to use it as an opportunity to therefore usher in a new sort of monetary system, whether that's the IMF's SDR or or what have you. I don't know where they're going to go with it necessarily, but I do believe that they want to use a crisis to bring in the new currency. They've talked about this before. The monetary system is old. It's outdated. They want to do away with the U.S. dollar. This would be a great opportunity to do so. Um, Some people talk about a one-world currency, and perhaps in a way it may be a one-world currency, but I don't think you as an individual will be using a different currency. I, I think you'll still have those same bills. They might have the queen's face on it or it might have uh, somebody else. But I, I think that what we are uh, looking at here is something that will be backing our current system. And, and I think it would be a great opportunity for them to bring in a new level of tyranny. And I think that it's something that we could see in – you know, relatively near future, not necessarily in a, in another generation or something like this. Let me just get this straight. You think that they're raising the interest rates right now to crash the economy. I mean, it, let's just take a look at housing, for instance. If they raise the rates, what happens to the housing market? If they raise the rates, what happens to the auto market? If they raise the rates, what happens to the bond market? I mean, when you look at these different areas and they're raising the rates, you're saying that these different areas would start to crash and crumble. They would suffer tremendously. The only reason why everything has been going the way it has been is number one, you have central banks buying up the shares as you talked about. That's the most important thing. And number two, we have easy monetary policies. These policies have allowed the system to, let's say, live, but not really. It's more like a zombie. And the increase in interest rates is going to collapse the whole system. It cannot survive. It's impossible. I mean, the amount of money they would have to print would therefore hyperinflate the currency. And there's no telling, you know, how long that that would take. But I you know the way I see it is it's the the only way out. So if the system does crash and you're saying that we move to a different currency, an SDR, some people have mentioned that. What about cryptocurrencies? I mean, this is, I mean, we see Bitcoin now, we see Ethereum. Do you think governments, central banks, do you think they would make the move to cryptocurrency? I really hope they don't. And that's the way I look at it. I I would not want them to hijack something that could be really good because and you know i don't know who's behind all of this i think it is more of a free market than anything i think that's what's happening at this time anyway i don't want the bankers and the governments to get involved in it i i think you know a lot of people think that great it's going to create um more market cap increase Personally, I don't want them to have anything to do with it. I want them to consider it to be the enemy's tool and everything else. I want them to get as far away from that as possible and leave it to you and I. And even if the price you know, would be just a fraction of what it would be had the bankers and everybody else get in on it, I'm fine with that. I think it's a tool that you and I can use and they should stay away. Now, I do think, however, I mean, I don't have to think, I've seen it already, that 
central banks and governments have been getting involved in either blockchains, they've been talking about cryptocurrencies, the Bank of Canada did a report on it uh, not too long ago, you saw what Russia is doing, um, in fact, quite a few governments around the world have been talking about it. And blockchain is a very sort of, you know, it's a, it's a wide term, but at least it shows that they're interested. And I do believe that it is something of the future, regardless of, you know, how it's implemented and how important it becomes. I think that this is something that governments want because right now money can really be uh, transferred without the knowledge of them and they want to tax it they want to be able to know exactly what's happening they also want the security for themselves too that's important but i think they'll create their own systems i don't necessarily think that they'll start using ethereum and bitcoin maybe they'll branch off of it but i don't think they'll necessarily want to use um, the same ones that we use i think perhaps they'll they'll be um, creating their own which altogether is probably bullish for the price of cryptocurrencies so i think it is a good thing so let me ask you this about uh cryptocurrencies i i look at bitcoin as being like equivalent to gold i'm not saying bitcoin is gold but i'm just looking at saying all right bitcoin is gold and ethereum is silver and i look at these two and these are not regulated they're not manipulated by the government, by the central bank, open source where people and decentralized where people can freely trade and there's no regulations attached to them. And we see Bitcoin and we see Ethereum moving up in price. Now, I look at this and say, if this was gold and silver, this is what we would be seeing right now. We would see them continually rise and rise and rise and saying, OK, guess what? The dollar is being devalued. This has more value and it's moving up. I know gold and silver is physical, but I'm looking at this to show that, hey, we can see the difference between something that is manipulated and controlled and something that is completely decentralized and unmanipulated. We can see how things, you know, reach their true market potential without central banks or anyone else touching them. And I, th I think right now with the cryptocurrency market, I, I think it's very young. I think there's a lot of work that still has to go into it. And I think that the governments, the central banks around the world would like to take hold of it, but I, I don't think it will be possible. So when we look at this entire economy and we see what is happening right now, what would your advice be to people who want to get into cryptocurrency? I believe that people should do their own due diligence. I don't think it's a it's it's not a good place to store all of your savings. I would say that. I think that we need to be very diversified. And I'm one that says you need to be diversified even within the asset class itself. So should you put all of your cryptocurrency part of your portfolio just Bitcoin? No, I think you should spread that out a little bit at least. Same with precious metals. If you own gold and silver, are you diversified within precious metals? No, you should own different types of gold and silver, different types of coins, different bullion, um, junk silver, common coins, whatever you want to call them, different levels of diversification and small denominations as well. The same with the cryptos. You want to have your money in different places. You don't want to, let's say, all keep it on an exchange, for example, because that's very risky. You want it in a hardware wallet. You know, you want to have some uh, perhaps on something like a blockchain.info where they suggest that your um, keys are not stored with them and, and so forth. Diversification. Do it that way. And I think that you should start small. And I really believe that take it slow. I know that it's anything but slow at this time. You can see the price going astronomical. Um, having said that, I believe that um, people should look at the different events that are going to happen, that events that we know are going to happen in the near future with cryptos. For example, you have the, what's called, for those who don't know, it's a hard fork, and that's an event coming up in the um, recent, or I should say, uh, in the near future for Bitcoin. There could be some major volatility at that point. 
There's also um, an event that's going to occur with uh, Ethereum later this year, potentially, where they're switching over um, to what's called proof of stake. These here are major events that occur, just like the Mt. Gox issue that happened previously. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in terms of is the price going to go down or up at these points. I don't know. But these are the major events. If we can make it past these major events, I see the price continuing to rise. So that's the type of thing that you need to be aware of. Any major events that are occurring and to be able to spread your money around. So if something's happening in Bitcoin, you also have Ethereum and you have Dash and you have other ones that you're not so worried and you don't want to necessarily throw all your savings at it in the same place it's just too dangerous nothing is bulletproof look at gold and silver for example if if somebody was actually counting on the appreciation you're probably not too happy if you've held gold over the last few years but of course like i always have said you don't want gold and silver because you think it's going to be worth more tomorrow you want gold and silver because they maintain value over a long period of time they are a store of value that's the important part now there's many people out there that uh, are looking at bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies and they're saying well this is just one gigantic bubble and it's going to pop uh, when you look at it do you think that we're in a crypto bubble So the prices right now, I would say that they're they're they've gone too hot too quickly. You know, when it was several months ago, I was actually saying on my YouTube channel how everybody should pay attention to this bull market because it's a lot more steady and it's not so crazy as the last one. And now here we are today seeing the prices go crazy yet again. There's a lot of euphoria. There's um, simply it, it has gone too hot too fast, but that doesn't mean that it cannot continue. I think that a lot of people are speculating on it right now. I think that's a problem. But it doesn't mean, I mean, let's say Bitcoin reaches $6,000. Well, if the price crashed by 50%, it would still be at $3,000. So you're looking at it like that. It's, you know, the same with gold and silver. I've always said, don't try to time the market because it's too difficult. If you feel that it's a good thing to invest in, you just put your money there and you wait and then you decide if you want to sell it at a later date or not. At the same time, we can use the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin as a medium of transaction as a method of transaction there's a lot of ways you know you can get your uh, debit card for bitcoin so then you could just go to the store like you normally would except that instead of taking it out of the bank you can use your bitcoin dollars or, or bitcoin currency this is a good thing for the future of cryptocurrencies as more and more places are adopting it you can actually see that there are many bitcoin vending machines all over the place They're taking a higher percentage at this time, but look, it's new. It's something that's going to happen. You can go right in, put your cash in there, and you can have that cash be converted to Bitcoin, and it's simply done there without any sort of identification need or anything else. It's all under the table. I think it's good. I think the fact that people in an area like China that has capital controls, they're able to use Bitcoin to move their money out of the country, and along the way, this is making money for people who uh, make a business out of having these exchanges. I think it's beneficial for everybody, and I think it is a very uh, good thing for the future of cryptocurrencies. Whether the price or not is going to go up from here, I can't tell. It looks like it's it's going to go up, that's for sure, particularly when you see things like Ethereum and everything else. It seems like we may, at least in the very short term, this is sort of plateaued a little bit, but I've seen it multiple times before just in the past few months where it hits a little small plateau and before you know it, the price has jumped considerably from there. Where are we headed with the economy right now? Where do you think the economy is going? Do you think we're just going to chug along the way it is or do you think that we're going to basically just completely collapse on ourselves? I think it'll be a continued slow rot 
The only thing that would prevent this from happening is if we have a major event like a war or um, some sort of, you know, riots or, or anything like this that takes place that spooks somebody. I think that otherwise we are going to just can have this continued slow rot. You'll see the assets being sold off places. You will see more and more um, unemployment, real unemployment that is. You see a lot of people who are simply, they've had enough. They've had enough of all the banking establishments. That's part of the reason why cryptocurrencies have risen so much. People don't want anything to do with the system. And you can see that. How many people are starting to go off the grid? You know that people don't like the system. They don't like the bankers. They don't like any of the so-called elite ruling over them. And that's sort of become a trend. This is a good thing. So I think that there's sort of this faction that has been uh, created over, let's say, the last 10 years or so, and it has been picking up. The economy is not going to do well. I don't believe it will. I I look at it like w- if we had removed all of the central bank financing of the bubbles that have been created today – the economy would show its true self. And that's the truth. This is happening globally. Globally right now, just year to date, over $1.5 trillion has been printed, and that's on the books, around the world. $1.5 trillion. That's a significant number, even though we look at it globally. And in fact, that's only a select few central banks. The economy's dead. The economy is completely dead and we're just pumping blood into a carcass. It looks like it's alive, I guess, but it's really not. And the only thing, the only thing that would fix this up is an economic detox. And I don't see that happening anytime soon, unfortunately. That's where we have a lot of people going off the grid. And I think that is a good thing. I I refer to it as becoming self-sufficient. I think that's the solution.